Welcome into this week's edition of Broadcaster Hour, coming to you from three different time zones. We've got Kyle Crooks representing the East. I'm in Birmingham representing the Central and out West, uh, outside of San Diego. We've got Josh Lewin, the voice of the UCLA Bruins. Josh, it's great to see you. I was thinking about this intro. By starting off, you've called so many games, so many teams, so many sports, so many networks. What's left on your broadcasting bucket list yeah. at this point? <laughs> you, you know, honestly, I, I mean, that's a great question. And uh, get me to Europe to do some uh, some soccer, I'd be a very happy man. That's one thing that's now formally on my bucket list. I'm a fan. I've got a team in the Premiership. I got a team in Serie A. I got a team in La Liga. So I'm just a I'm a fan, but I'm really a fan of the broadcasting. I mean, I just think that the uh, the, the lyrical nature of soccer in general and the the way the the poetry and prose kind of intersect with a lot of how those European broadcasters do it. I love it. So that uh, if anybody wants to to fly me to uh, to England sometime as soon as we're allowed back in, uh, I'd be happy with that. Well, Josh, how fun was this last season for you, specifically with UCLA basketball that has such a, a great tradition and, you know, from the first four to the final four and while the the, the environments were different in, in the final four specifically and, and for you having a long career of calling pro sports and, and getting into college sports and getting an opportunity to call a big game like that, although it does not finish the way you want, just overall, what was that moment like for you to call those big moments for UCLA basketball this year? Well, it was a crazy year in every way, as you guys know. You know, I mean, having to, to call the, the road games from you know, basically a cubby hole, somebody's conference room, and, you know, hoping that the connection would stay. And, I mean, there were a couple games where I literally am calling a game off the app on my phone, you know, and it's like, is, are we in L.A.? You know, I mean, is this really happening? I thought this was like a big market, you know. Um, and... UCLA stumbled down the stretch. They lost four straight games. They were the very last team into the tournament. I mean, I thought it was 50-50 that they were even going to get in. So I packed really light for Indianapolis. I thought they'd be eliminated immediately. I packed for uh, three days. I figured, well, you know, maybe they somehow beat Michigan State and they'll stay around. So I'll pack for three days instead of one. I ended up making, what, three or four round trips back and forth to Indianapolis because I mean even as a UCLA honk I didn't I didn't believe it I didn't think they'd keep going and uh the Gonzaga game which by the way is now a rematch it was announced yesterday is gonna be awesome uh in Vegas right before Thanksgiving but uh, you know those kind of games I'm sure you guys can relate it's like when you're in the eye of the storm you don't even realize that you're part of something that epic or that historic it's just, you know you're, you're working so hard just to try to tell a story and keep up with the narrative and sure you're aware there's whatever it was, 19 lead changes and 23 ties. And, you know, one team is shooting 60%, the other is shooting 65. I mean, so you're, you're well aware it's a great game. But, you know, it wasn't until walking back to the hotel that you realize, like, well, wait a minute. I mean, people are reacting like that's even a better game than Duke, Kentucky with, with Leitner. And I'm like, is that right? I mean, could that be right? And then you go back and kind of read about it and watch it. And you're like, holy shit, that actually was even cooler than I thought. I mean, to be a part of something like that. So, uh, yeah, it, it didn't have the ending that, that you wanted. Cinderella, you know, didn't keep going. But uh, it, it was great to be a part of that for sure. And what are you thinking when you're calling that moment, you know, the buzzer beater, and you're the opposite team on their home radio? You got to give it somewhat of an emotion, but you also know who your listenership is. And you know that the bulk of your listenership is pretty disappointed at that point in time but your call was pitch perfect the way you had it you had enough emotion had enough description while realizing the heartbreak that the majority of your off your, your audience was feeling just what did you think in that moment as a broadcaster of how you wanted to try and deliver that moment well you know what's funny is i was vaguely aware all game that we had a run of three games where we, we get bumped uh ucla does for the dodgers and for clippers basketball where we're third on the the pecking order on, on the best station in town. So it's, it's kind of, you know, the, the price you pay to be on the station you want to be on. But I remember just thinking vaguely, you know, this is such a good game. And there's a Clippers Orlando magic game that's preempting us. It's like, really, you know, it's kind of a bummer to be farmed down the dial. It's like, I hope people even know what station we're on, you know, but, um, I don't know. I mean, it, it just was, uh, it was, it's always such a privilege to be calling a game no matter what it is. I mean, this is what we all want to do for a living. This is what we've all worked towards our whole lives. And 
you, th that's some some stinking thinking. You know, I mean, I, I was very cognizant that, OK, I mean, don't worry about if two people are listening or two million people are listening. Uh, you know, the fact that the Bruins are in the Elite Eight, that's really cool. So just kind of keep keep on moving. But, um, yeah, the fact that all those games had some sort of really cool narrative. I mean, you know, there were overtime games and buzzer beaters and, uh, you know, just watching that team kind of coalesce before our eyes and knowing that there were so many fans that would have been so happy to be part of it if life were normal. You know, I mean, it's like everybody's locked out pretty much. So, you know, you, you raise your game even more knowing that, that you're the only conduit that uh, that's out there for people that aren't watching it on TV. Of course, you've been with so many iconic teams throughout the years in your career. What have you liked about this role with UCLA and getting connect with their football and men's basketball fans? And again, it doesn't get any more iconic in men's basketball than UCLA. Well, it, iconic's the right word, and I think that's the biggest thing that, that got me uh, fired up. I mean, there was a, a year where I was trying to juggle Mets, Chargers, and UCLA, and it's like, all right, well, I know something's got to drop because I'll be dead, you know, trying to do all three of these. I'm, I'm not in my 20s anymore. Um, and honestly, you know, the UCLA thing, when it came, it was kind of like, uh, I don't want to say it was hedging my bets, but it's like, I don't know what's going to happen with the Chargers. They might be going to L.A., and who knows if they're going to take me with them. Uh, you know, I know I want to still be doing football and basketball. And the more I thought about it, it's like, you know, I haven't been part of a lot of iconic anything in my career. I've been a real vagabond in baseball and you know, just kind of going from job to job. You know, my, my college, uh, you know, that I, I went to was Northwestern. They certainly weren't winning any Rose Bowls or going to any Final Fours. And, you know, the, the Mets did sneak into a World Series. And I'm forever grateful about that. But, you know, the Chargers never got to a Super Bowl and they're not exactly an iconic team uh you know and it, obviously at that point with ownership and everything else it, it, you know i mean it, it, they certainly weren't looked at as anything uh palatable you know on the nfl front so ucla is kind of like well wait a tick i mean this is like notre dame i mean this is like you know duke basketball or you know whatever and i had actually kind of grown up a ucla fan which is a whole nother story but the more i thought about it i'm like you know this is the one i want to keep I mean, this is really fun. It's the, the school colors, and you guys do college ball, so you know. I mean, there's nothing like that college football Saturday at a venue like the Rose Bowl. And if, if and when they ever fill it, you know, if the team is ever good, that, that's even better. Uh, and and Pauly, you know, I mean, if, if those are your two places of, of residence, so to speak, you know, the Rose Bowl and Pauly Pavilion, you know, all due respect to Qualcomm Stadium in San Diego where the Chargers played, but that was not an iconic venue. So, um the chances I was about to turn 50 to feel like I was finally with an iconic brand was actually a, a motivating factor for sure. And we always like to ask, what was the spark? Why did you want to get into this business? And how soon did you realize in your young life that you wanted to be a broadcaster? Oh, man. I mean, I, I never wanted to do anything else. I was one of those kids. I mean, you know, the hell with being an astronaut or a fireman or any of that nonsense. So just, you know, no interest. This is always what I wanted to do. And the problem with that is, and this is, you know, I have to kind of go back and make this speech to anybody who's thinking of getting in the business or already in the business, is please don't do it like I did, which is become so single-minded in that pursuit that you forget to have a life. You know, I was one of those guys that just, you know, I, I just wanted to broadcast all the time. I was a gym rat. And I figured that's the only way I can get better. And, and that's true, but, you know, it, there's a balance, you know, everything but in balance, I think, is the phrase. And uh, even though I set my coordinates and chased down the dream and that's great, you know, there were too many nights where I was in in triple A ball in my 20s where, you know, I, I'm thinking back. I never once went out. You know, I mean, the players are my own age I and mean, everybody's going out to a bar after the game. I'm going back to the the quality in Syracuse to listen to my tapes and you know like chart okay well i like that i didn't like that i mean so man, i'm glad i did that i'm glad that i took it seriously but you know maybe lighten up francis just a little bit you know i mean take an hour or two and go have a pop with the guys after the game you know there's nothing's on your permanent record and, you know there's nobody that's going to be you know a, in a corner with one of those little tiny notebooks going lewin says he's serious about the industry but i see him having beers you know and i just i really did like live in fear that like you know i, I didn't have the greatest voice i didn't have great connections i mean my last name is you know not buck or carrie or brenneman or any of that stuff i mean so um 
I, I just kind of figured, all right, I'm going to have to do this on my own and nobody's going to outwork me, you know, if, whatever. You know, I mean, that, that's a great um, mission statement, but to, to live it that fully, I don't think you have to do. So, uh, you know, I'm in my early 50s now and I look back at my early 20s, mid 20s self and I'm just like, dude, you know, you, you could have relaxed a little bit. And what was that Rochester booth like? And, and Bob Sosi, who's helped me in my career, now the voice of the New England Patriots, a young Josh Lewin and a yeah. young Bob Sosi in that booth. What was that booth like? Well, and Glenn Geffner, too, uh, who's now the voice of the Marlins and uh, was a good friend of mine in college. Uh, so Pawtucket is the launching pad for sure. I mean, Rochester is, is not. But I was really lucky for sure. To, to You know, I had Sos uh, for a, a couple of years. I had Geff for a couple of years. They both went on to do great things. And, you know, and they work their asses off, too. And, and uh, you know, the, the minor league experience, as you guys know, there's no substitute for it. You know, it would start to rain. We throw it back to the station and they play like, you know, 40s big band music, which is right with our demographic. That's perfect. Uh, and, and you run downstairs and you help pull the tarp uh, and you ruin another pair of shoes. And then you go back upstairs and sign the game back on when it's time. To, I mean, you know, those are great experiences. And I think we all need to to have them and do them and, and enjoy them because, uh, you know, there was nobody at city field when it rained asking me to go down and help pull the tarp. And I, I kind of wanted to, cause that, you know, that's actually kind of fun. And talking about the first big break in your career, you get to the big leagues, uh, with the Orioles and then you, you're a big part of the MLB on Fox, uh, in its early stages for a very long time. Was that the first really big break for you in your career? And how did that come about? Yeah, for sure. I had two really lucky breaks. I mean, I was in Rochester for what felt like forever, but it was five years and it's my hometown. And, you know, I started when I was uh, an intern when I was 16, you know, so it really was like nine years if you include that. And so there's part of me, I'm 25. I'm thinking I'm never getting out of my hometown. You know, I'll never do what I want to do for real. You know, I'll always be a Rochester guy. Not that there's anything wrong with Rochester. It's just that, you know, I had bigger aspirations and, uh, the Orioles were the major league affiliate. I had worked up a relationship with them a little bit, got a, a one game audition to come up and fill in for John Miller. And the game got rained out, which I thought was just the worst thing that ever happened to me. And they asked me to fill in on the rain delay doing talk, which I'd never done before, but it's like, well, of course, you know, whatever they ask me to do, I'll do. And I had driven Rochester to Baltimore for that opportunity at my own expense, drove back, you know, in time to make the next, Rochester Red Wings game and you know it's like six and a half hours each way and I remember just like bawling on, on my way home I'm like that you know I have one chance you know one big break and the game didn't even get played uh and as it turns out I, I did okay enough on that talk show fill-in during the rain delay I didn't know but they were looking for a new sports director their talk show guy and pre and post game host was about to leave to do hockey full-time guy named Jeff Rimmer who's now in Columbus so I got this very surprising phone call a little bit, uh, a couple weeks later saying, you know, this is the opening. We liked what you did during the rain delay. Would you have interest in this job? And, you know, by the way, you'd probably be filling in on maybe 10, 11 games during the year. Well, I didn't care about the talk at all. I just, you know, 10, 11 big league games a year. That's what I wanted. I mean, that's fantastic. So uh, dropped everything, pursued that, was lucky enough to get that job. And sure enough, in 1990. Five, I guess it was. Um, yeah, 1995. I started as talk show guy in Baltimore, pre and post game host, uh, filled in every once in a while. The, the strike was still going. So again, I'm like, come on, you know, I'm finally in the big leagues and there's no baseball, but it, it, it got going. And my, my huge lucky break was that's when, as you say, um, MLB on Fox was just starting up. Fox itself was just starting up. And I didn't know this, but their whole M.O. was they wanted young, kind of malleable guys. They didn't want to go out and you know just put Dick Stockton in the booth or whatever. They wanted a bunch of 20-somethings. So they found Joe Buck, no-brainer. You know, Tom Brenneman, no-brainer. Um, you know, Chip Carey was going to be part of the coverage. And I always tell people they just ran out of guys with, you know, with last names. So, they, you know, they very fortunately, they decided let's take one complete unknown. It was kind of like... A, reality show that wasn't invented yet let's take like one guy that nobody's ever heard of and just like throw him out there and see what happens and that ended up being me only because uh the guy that was casting for it a guy named john Filippelli, who now runs the yes network um he lived in greenwich connecticut would drive home 
from the office to Greenwich and put on the Orioles pregame show because the Orioles were like the hot team that year. There was a lot of interesting stuff going on, and, and I was the pre- and postgame guy. So he knew my name. He knew my voice. He knew my work. So when, you know, the casting call went out, send us some stuff, you know, if you're young, I'm like, all right, you know, I'm sure I don't have a shot at this, but I said, but John Filippelli knew who I was only because WBAL got into his car, you know, going to and from Greenwich, Connecticut. And um, he needed TV tape. The only TV tape I had, you know, the Red Wings did like three games a year on TV. The only one I had on VHS was the one that was done the night that OJ was getting chased in the Ford Bronco. Uh, and I remember thinking during that game, the 1994 game, it was Rochester against Syracuse, so there was a player that was in the booth with me that had never done you know, anything like that before. It was, it was a horrible broadcast. And I remember walking out like in the fifth inning of the main press box to get a drink, and everybody in that press box, like five people, but you know, they're, they're laughing at me like, you know, you're doing a TV game, and nobody's watching because the Knicks and Rockets are playing over here and OJ is getting chased through L.A. over here. And I'm like, you're right. You know, I might as well just say fuck on the air because no one will ever hear this. <laughs> and that's the tape. I mean, that's the game that ended up going to John Filippelli and him saying, OK, come on out for an audition and blah, blah, blah. So point of all that is you just never know. You, you really don't. You know, you don't know who's listening. You don't know when something's going to break you you really don't and you, you think you have plans and you think you've networked really well and oh here's going to be my path in a million years you know the oj game and you know john Filippelli, here's my pregame show in the car um so you know total dumb luck and and i tell people all the time guys i mean i, I flew way too close to the sun with all that i was not ready to be a network tv guy but all of a sudden i'm a network tv guy and the cubs then you know call and i'm on wgn uh, and, you know, supposedly Harry Carey's heir apparent. And I, none of that was ever supposed to happen. I wasn't good enough for that. But, you know, all of a sudden you're on network TV and people think you're that good. So uh, I think the, the chips settled in the bag where they were supposed to eventually. I don't think I was ever supposed to be, uh, you know, a number two or number three network TV guy. I always just wanted to be a radio baseball broadcaster. And I think the happiest I ever was was the seven years in New York doing the Mets as the number two with Howie Rose, because that was always the job I wanted to have. And um, I think that was a better fit for me. You know, TV is the money's great and the exposure is great, but uh, there's a lot of nonsense. And, you know, we had so much fun in that booth just talking about the Mets and just being ourselves. And it, it, so when you know, this is a very long answer, but when the UCLA thing came up, it was kind of like, all right, yeah, you know, this is the kind of stuff that I'm comfortable with. I like doing Chargers radio, like doing Mets radio rather than try to get back into TV. Uh, I think this is what I want to do. So um, that was probably living my best life was that year that it was Chargers and Mets and UCLA. But like I say, it was just not a, a sustainable model. <laughs> well, and of course, you mentioned every path is different. We'll start with that disclaimer, but you look at what you're able to do. Call a lot of minor league baseball and then also getting good with the flagship station, be around, and then eventually that leads to some play-by-play. -play. So if you're to give advice to college students who want to be a baseball radio broadcaster and they say, okay, I can have the opportunity to work minor league baseball at some random city across the country or get to one of the teams I want to work for, work my way up through that station, what do you say? It, I mean, there is simply no correct answer. It is such a crapshoot. I mean, look at what I'm doing now. I just started uh, started back up with the Mets uh, to help them launch a, a podcast platform. And, you know, that's kind of become a pivot for me. Uh, you know, I still love play by play, obviously. But there are so many different ways to gild the lily uh, on this thing where, yes, the traditional path. I mean, when I was growing up, you, you know, you go single A, double A, triple A majors. Done. And. Not a lot of people did that anyway, as it turns out. Um, and then you, you start looking around at who's getting jobs now and how they get jobs. You know, I mean, Will Fleming, buddy of mine, great announcer, um, you know, was busting his ass in the minors and nothing was really breaking. And then, you know, he starts doing the Red Sox pregame show on WEEI. You know, things start to change. And, and now, you know, he's the heir apparent to Joe Castiglione. He'll be the voice of the Red Sox for the next 40 years if he wants to. So that was kind of a side door. Um, you know, you can say the podcast game is a is a great side door. You know, I mean, start doing things for the team or for the radio station, uh, you know, develop a YouTube presence. I'm amazed. I mean, this is kind of going off topic. But, you know, what I told the Mets was, look, 
um, you know, if you go on an NFL web page, it says schedule, roster, tickets, podcasts. I mean, like, that's what a big deal podcasts are for, like, an NBA team, an NFL team. Now, baseball isn't quite there yet. Baseball is always the last on pretty much everything. But um, obviously, it's not just radio anymore. It's not just TV. People want their content now when they want it at their convenience. They want a lot of it. They don't just want a three-hour broadcast that they might, you know, they might be working during those three hours anyway. They can't even hear it. So if you're a Mets fan and you really want to know what's up with the team and still hear some highlights. So, I mean, that's just basically what I told them is I think you guys you know, would do your fans a real service if you offered this product. So my prediction is not that I'm some uh, sage, but I think we're very quickly approaching a point where every professional team, and this is already happening in Europe with soccer, you got your, your TV guy, you got your radio guy, and you got your, your digital guy. You know, there's going to be a team radio broadcaster and a team podcaster for every big league team in the near future is my prediction. Um, you know, football, like I say, has kind of embraced that. The Cowboys have 12 different podcasts. They only play 16 games, you know, but all, all year round there is content. And that to me is the single biggest change in the industry. You know, when I broke in, it's like if you want to do research, well, there's a media guide and a library. Remember libraries like, you know, I mean, I would literally go to whatever library. I'm mean, again, such a nerd. You know, I'm in Toledo with the Rochester Red Wings. Where's the Toledo library so I can read a book on the history of baseball in Ohio? So I'll have something to offer on the book. Now you just, you know, you hit two buttons and on the Internet, everything's everywhere. You know, you, you have to do no research of your own. So, OK, there's all this information out there. Everybody wants it. How do you curate it? What do you do with it? And um, I just think there's such a big opportunity for anybody looking to break in right now. Pick a team, whether it's your favorite team or somebody, I think even better, just somebody who's not doing this yet and convince them, hey, look, you know, this is the zeitgeist. This is where, uh, you know, modern America is going here. People are driving around. They're getting back out now with the pandemic, hopefully winding down. They want just a shit ton of content and they want it when they want it. And it's up to you guys to offer it to them. Oh, you're not doing it yet. Well, my hand's in the air. I know how to mix a podcast. I know how to start a YouTube channel. Let me help. Let me be of service. So, you know, there's never been a time where you have the opportunity, if you want to break into broadcasting, to break into broadcasting just by simply doing it and offering your, your services. Uh, you know, when I was in, it's not sound like I'm 100 years old and shaking my fist at the clouds, and I apologize, but when I was in college in Chicago at Northwestern, the only thing I could think of to get a basketball tape was I had the old broadcasting yearbook, which is like that thick. Uh, and I, you know, it lists every radio station in America, lists every general manager. So I'm looking for, okay, well, like, what's a 5,000 watt, 1,000 watt day timer or something? You know, what, what, what tiny little station can I find to go broadcast like three Chicago State University basketball games just so I can have some tape. And, you know, I had to convince Chicago State University, please let me do this. I had to like, you know, borrow equipment from people because nobody had their own equipment then. Uh, you know, had to make these cold calls to radio stations to try to find, that was the only way you could get on the air. There was no YouTube, there's no Twitch, you know. So um, you don't have to bust your ass like that anymore, you know, to, to kill yourself to, at a loss do a Chicago State game, you know, just so you have tape. So uh, put yourself out there, go invent something, and and go uh, go make yourself a career. It's really good advice. And speaking of advice, who were some of the mentors you leaned on, whether it was in your minor league days with Rochester, early time in the big leagues? Who were some of the people you leaned on the most to get some feedback on your work and also just help you uh, make that transition to Major League Baseball? That's a great question, and I, I hate it, though, because I'm going to leave people out. <laughs> but... Uh, Gary Cohen, who's now the, the Mets TV voice, was always such a great sounding board. I mean, I was 16 years old and practicing my play-by-play -play in the booth next to his. And, you know, he would unsolicited, hey, you know, let me hear it. You know, let me hear what you got. And, you know, we, we developed this nice, you know, kind of uh, like uh, he was my rabbi, you know, kind of relationship. And, and uh, so Gary, for sure, you know, so many people, John Miller, I got to work with, Ernie Harwell, I got to work with. I mean, you know, always hoped that Harry would have been a, a mentor in Chicago that didn't quite work out and you know that, that's fine but um you know just so many people along the way that have been so 
kind with their time and their energy and uh you know not not everybody is is as willing as the next guy but there's just there's so many great people in this business that that just want i mean costas has been great you know i mean just a sounding board that i've come to to really love having that connection and you know maybe the most famous person in my cell phone so uh you know the, i think that there's um there's no shortage of people out there, thankfully, that'll want to help you get to the next level. And I've been really lucky to, to find people like that. And and we talked a little bit about your relationship with Howie Rose and those years with the Mets. And, and I remember, you know, living here in New Jersey. I live in Gainesville now. I'm here in New Jersey now. But just driving around, listening to FAN and listening to you and Howie, you have a very similar style in that you're very quick witted. You can kind of ping pong back and forth off of each other. How did that relationship develop since getting that job and, and just, you know, how great is Howie? Just being around Howie every day, how much did you learn from a guy like that? Well, the thing about Howie that I just learned by osmosis is he he's just such a natural, you know. I mean, I, I have to organize everything. If, you know, if it's my turn to do an open, you know, I've got an outline, if not a script. And Howie just turns on the mic and he's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just I don't know how he does it. So, um we, we do share a, a similar, I guess, sensibility just in terms of what a broadcast should sound like and, and what the Mets are all about. I mean, you know, I mean, Gary and Howie are way more knowledgeable about the Mets than I am. But, you know, I, I was a fan. I was a Mets fan. So at least I'm kind of a, a silver or bronze medalist to, to their gold. But um, he's a, a great example of somebody who takes his job very seriously, but not himself super seriously. And, and I think that's the secret sauce. You know, somebody who wants to uh, make sure that it's a job well done every time. But if you punt one, if something doesn't go well, uh, you know, you, you, you can't you can't kill yourself. You got to be able to move on. And uh, so a lot of great lessons from Howie. You know, we're not it's funny because there's, there's enough of an age difference. It's not you know, we, we very rarely went out to dinner on the road. I mean, maybe maybe five times a year you know i mean it's not like we wore the same footy pajamas and he was on the top bunk and i was on the bottom bunk i mean it wasn't quite like that but but on the air yes i mean i think it sounded that way and and, and that's uh hopefully what met fans got out of that and let me transition a bit because people you go through a lot of disappointment uh, in this industry it's very subjective not objective at all and you know that the chargers moving or whether it's moving on from the rangers it, you're somebody who's had a lot of great opportunities and, and have a great opportunity now but you've also gone through some disappointment i would say in your career how did you personally you know deal with the, the Chargers situation the rangers situation to say to yourself yeah this happens but now we move on and, and we look for the next venture yeah those were the two you nailed it that i felt i really didn't have control over the other times that i kind of set out on this unintentional Edwin Jackson existence of just, you know, playing for every team. Uh, you know, it made sense to leave the Orioles for the Cubs, made sense to leave the Cubs for the Tigers. Um, you know, it made sense to, from a family standpoint to leave the Tigers for the Rangers. Not that I didn't love my time with the Rangers, but I was very happy in Detroit was married to somebody who wasn't. And, you know, sometimes it's just bigger than your career. You do what's right for your family. My wife at the time was from Texas, really wanted to get back. So, you know, all those moves made sense. The Rangers one was tough because it seemed to be working. I liked it. Um, but then ownership changed and ownership always has a right to set the tone. And, you know, the, the, the one meeting I had with Nolan Ryan was, uh, look, <laughs> you know, I literally drive to work on Nolan Ryan Expressway. Uh, there is no Josh Lewin Expressway. You know, I mean, so I'm very cognizant that you're in charge. Whatever you want from the broadcast, I... I'm here. You know, I'm going to try to do it your way. But it wasn't a great fit. You know, I mean, Nolan wanted the broadcast down a certain way, kind of right down the middle. No yucks, no out of town scores, no Seinfeld references. I mean, all that stuff, you know, and it's the whole to thine own self be true. If we learn anything from our Shakespeare and, you know, the more I thought about it, uh, I'm like, you know, this this is not a fit anymore. It just doesn't work. And so that, you know, that one, we shook hands and walk away. It's not like they said, get the fuck out of here. I mean, we just agreed this is, does not work anymore. And whoever is in charge of the team gets to make that call. That's just how that goes. I mean, Ernie Harwell was once let go by the Tigers because Bo Schembechler didn't like him. I mean, you know, what, what are you going to do? So um, 
The Chargers one was maybe even more disappointing because that one was just geography. Um, they decided, and again, it's their want. You know, they just they did not want the the stank of San Diego on them when they went to L.A. You know, so it's like, well, you can't live in San Diego. We don't want that. Uh, we don't want you doing Mets. And I'm like, well, well, wait a minute. You know, I can't just leave the Mets midseason, number one. Uh, number two is I've been commuting in to do Chargers from Dallas and from New York this whole time. You know, so what's the commute from San Diego to L.A. is nothing. That's a drive. You know, it's not a six hour flight. I've been doing that for 12 years and I just started UCLA. My argument was, do you guys not know what the L.A. stands for in UCLA? It's like I beat you to that city. You know, I'm already there. And they're like, well, you know, this is just how we feel. And again, it, they're right. You know, I mean, I thought I mean, I love doing those games. I miss the NFL so much. I, I really, really, really miss the NFL. But uh, again, you know, that that's what they decided was what they wanted to do. My idea was, OK, you know, let me at least help you push the boat off the dock. Let me help you bring all those years of Chargers history with you. Let's groom somebody. And my vote was going to be Matt Money Smith, who ended up getting the job anyway. I'm like, you know, my idea was let me do it at least one last year, help you with the transition. Uh, let's make money the sideline guy. And then eventually it just all and they didn't want to hear it. So I'm like, OK, I mean, I guess we're just done. So that one hurt that one. But you know what, though, that that solved the riddle of what do I do about, um, you know, dropping Mets or Chargers or Bruins? Like, all right, I guess it's going to be the Chargers. Um, and then, uh, you know, I did something that uh, felt right at the time, you know, the, the, the opportunity to be on the West Coast 100 percent of the time. I thought there was a job in San Diego with the Padres. My deal was up with the Mets. Uh, they were changing stations. There was no guarantees. I'm like, well, you know, I'm just going to go to San Diego full time. That was kind of the third disappointment is the job that was uh, promised to me by the radio station never ended up getting created. So I moved all the way out here for no job. Well, I mean, except obviously for UCLA, which is a, a great job. But, you know, now I'm missing half my my income. So uh, had to get creative at that point, And that's kind of where the podcast pivot happened. And, and now, uh, you know, again, it's never what you think it's going to be. You know, I mean, when the Chargers left. Uh, I'm thinking, all right, well, I guess my lot is I'm a, a Mets and UCLA guy and I'll make that work. And then I'm like, oh, OK, well, I'll be a Padres UCLA guy. Oh, that's not going to work. All right, I'll do something else in UCLA. And now I'm right back to the Mets doing their podcast stuff, but doing it remotely from San Diego, which is perfect. So um, the, the whole thing about you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. It, it's really true. You know, you just never know how it's going to end up. Yeah, Kyle and I have certainly seen that in our careers as well. I uh, do want to ask you about football and calling it on the radio all the years of the Chargers and now with UCLA. Uh, just what's most important to you when you're describing the game? And we can go through this with all the different sports, including baseball and basketball in a moment. But it's specifically football, do you always go back to the same formula kind of each and every play? What's most important to you? I, I wish I did. I think that's actually a great strategy. I'm way too ADD to be that disciplined you know it's always down in distance it's always simple geography you know just let me know where the ball is i think that's exactly every sport is that you know tell me where the ball is if you're doing radio and i kind of try to just go from that and fill in from there but you know i think in football rhythm is so important you know and i wasn't great at that always with the chargers by the way because you're, you're thinking sometimes oh i've got the perfect anecdote right after this guy just carried the ball that reminds me of this but then you're leaving your color commentator no time to do his thing so i think football more than any other it's a very regimented rhythm where you know you you call the play and then just get the hell out of the way and if your color commentator leaves you some room on the back end to pick something back up or stick something in there as an addendum that's great but i think football is the one sport where it's kind of like stay in your lane uh you know I, i've got the the who and the what and the where, and I want the color commentator to give me the why and the how. Easy. You know, it's like, I'll do these three, you do those two. And let's get out of each other's way, and then when there's a break in the action, we can yuck it up and have fun. But there's just, you know, you, you can't miss in, in football. You can't miss a play. You can't be talking over the snap. You just can't. Um, you know, basketball is a little different. I mean, again, it's all rhythm. And it's funny, when I filled in on the, the Clippers broadcast uh, the couple times that I did this past winter, uh, you know, they do their radio old school, where it's like Bill King from the old days. It's just you. That's it. You know, there's no color commentator. It's liberating, but it's exhausting. 
uh, you know, so it, it, I would always jump back into UCLA, like, you know, wanting to give Tracy Murray like a big kiss on the mouth. Like, thank you. You know, I got somebody to bounce things off of now. This is wonderful. Um, baseball, obviously, is the most conversational of the sports. I think that's the rhythm you want to strive for is, you know, it's just to, and it's funny because this is exactly what Nolan Ryan didn't like, but that's OK. It, to me, it was always it should sound like two guys sitting at a bar or sitting on the porch, just kind of talking about baseball, talking about life, talking about the game. That's what I like. Not everybody does. But I, to me, I think that's a good rhythm to strive for. And, um, you know, hockey, which I haven't done in a while, but I really love. I think that's similar to soccer, where, again, just tell me where the puck is. Tell me where the ball is. And when there is a whistle or when the ball's out of bounds, you know, in, in uh, soccer, then you can jump in and then do some other tap dance. And you mentioned with baseball being conversational. Is that just something that has to come naturally? Is there a way to work on it a little more? You know, I've gotten that feedback sometimes. Hey, you got to be more conversational. What's the best way to do that? That's a really great question. I don't know. I think, you know, some of it, and, and this is a little deep and a little psychological, I think the advantage I had growing up as a latchkey kid where you got to kind of make your own uh, entertainment sometimes I think that's actually a, a boon, you know, whether you're talking to yourself or talking to your brother or talking to, you know, a playmate, whatever it is. I think in your developmental years, are you talking a lot is probably something fundamental. And um, I, I hadn't really even thought about that until we're spitballing now. But, you know, the, the number of times where it was just me and my brother in the driveway with the hockey net out, you know, or, uh, you know, throwing a ball around and I, I just felt like I, there was always conversation going. And uh, so maybe that's natural. You know, maybe if you're a chatty Kathy, that, that works to your advantage. And if you're not, uh, you know, maybe there are ways to, to come out of your shell. But uh, I would think that just, yeah, having a natural inclination to just want to talk to people and having a natural curiosity and or a natural take. I think of a guy like Colin Cowherd, who's just, you know, I mean, he could talk about any subject really intelligently for an hour. That's a gift. I mean, I don't really have that, but I think what I have developed is just in, in baseball anyway, it's a talking sport. So you, you better start talking. And and listening to your stuff throughout the years, Josh, what I've noticed is you, you definitely vary up your descriptors. You're not, you don't use the same word twice, you know, whether it's in the same inning or in the same media stretch in a basketball game. Do you, is that something you think about in the back of your mind? Do you have a list of terms or is this just years and years of going to libraries and, and reading <laughs> things and just having an inventory of different words? Well, you know what? It's funny. When I was a teenager and in my 20s, I actually used to have, and again, everything's changed. I mean, obviously, we, you know, we had no laptops. I would like to feel like I'm literally a million years old. But I had, ask your mom or ask grandma, there used to be like these recipe um, containers where you'd put index cards, like four by six index cards in this little plastic box so you could like access your recipes. So I had one of those boxes that I traveled with and I had index cards that, you know, the, the little subheadings were, here's the Toledo Mud Hens cards, here's the Rochester Red Wings cards. But then I had a little category in the back that was vocabulary. And I had another one that was like interesting facts, you know, and I'd always strive to like every day or every couple of days add something so, you know, I went from a couple index cards to like 40 index cards. So, yeah, when I was developing in my 20s, I absolutely did that. I don't know what happened to that box. I haven't thought about it in years. And, and the point being that I think once you get up and running, you don't need that as a crutch. And I think, you know, where I go and, and it's I can't explain it. Like, you know, somebody asked me once, well, you know, and, and they were very sarcastic about it. Well, you know, you said that. The first time that Ike Davis was up, he carved one foul. Then the next time he peeled one foul. What's the difference between carving and peeling? And I'm like, you know what? I I don't know. But when it leaves the bat, I do know. It's like it, it leaves a certain way and, you know, carve is just the right word. And then the next time it, it had, a, like I don't know, like a three degree different, a differentiation in how it arced. That's a peel. Yeah, I just... I don't know why, but it's like the more you do this, you just kind of immediately, you know, something gets banged down the line because, yeah, it, you know, it, it was great contact. Something gets pounded. I mean, I don't know what the difference between those two things are, but I think if you do this long enough, you just for some weird reason, it's like, oh, in your mind, it's like, well, that's a bang. You know, that next one, well, that's a pound. And it, you're not thinking or going through a list 
uh, and checking him off. Like, well, I, you know, I used this verb, you know, and then I, now I'm going to use this one. That, you know, Mike Emmerich was the best ever. Yeah, at that. I mean, somebody once counted there was like 135 different descriptors that he used in a hockey game. You know, things are waffle boarded over here and shanked over here. But I, I've never talked to Mike about that. But I think that that's probably where he went with it too. It just hits your brain a certain way, and that's what you call it. And I think the only way to develop that is just to see a lot of hockey or see a lot of baseball, and you know, eventually it just hits your mind that certain way. You don't even think about it anymore. And shifting a little bit in terms of now your preparation, so UCLA football, I think they, they start off with Hawaii, right? And so, you know, how far out are you creating your boards? Do you do boards? And, and what what do they look like? What, what kind of is a, a week in preparation for you for a football game like? So in the off season, which is now, I just try to be somewhat disciplined about getting out in front of stuff. So it's like anytime I see an article on any team, obviously including UCLA, that the Bruins are going to play, uh, I'll clip it, you know, just kind of put it in my, I've got a one note system now because I don't need a recipe box, but, uh, you know, I'll just, I've got my, my tabs, you know, all set for the season. There's, you know, 12 opponents. So here they are starting with Hawaii. And I read something about Hawaii just the other day, clipped it out, threw it in, in one note. Won't even look at any of that until what was that first game, August 28th. I'll, on August 22nd, I'll start going through, you know, like on that Monday and get all my Hawaii stuff done, get their roster done, uh, you know, start looking at their press notes if they have them out yet. Um, so it's kind of like, all right, let's start getting ready for the opponent on the Monday. Then Tuesday, Wednesday, it's pretty much anything UCLA updating what's just happened. And obviously, you know, uh, off season, you're, you're keeping that file really thick for now. But in season, it's just, well, what happened last week and what do you need to update, update the stats, you know, all the the blogs, whatever that are out there that you want to read. And like, oh, that's interesting. I might want to look into that um, and, you know, try to go to a practice on, on Wednesday, see if I can get some notes and nuggets or something like that. The one thing about living in San Diego and not in L.A. is it's not like I'm a fixture on campus. You know, it's a pretty good commute to get up to L.A. So practice a week is probably about my my speed. Um, Thursday and Friday, it's kind of just putting everything together. And, and like you say, actually doing the board, which I do, um, it's kind of a combo. It's not quite by hand. It's a little bit on the computer, a little bit by hand, but we'll try to get all that done by Friday night, get it all printed by Friday night. And then Saturday morning, is just this very long, um, you know, hopefully it's like a mid afternoon or evening game and not one of those nooners. Uh, but you know, you get there, you review it. You highlight things, um, you know, you keep your ears open for what's going on day of game and, you know, kind of start talking about game plans with with your partner. So everybody's got their own system. But I mean, I would say total is probably about a 15 hour prep week for football. Uh, and then, you know, the, the game day itself, you know, is a, is a 10 hour day. So you know, it's a 25 hour commitment during the week. Basketball, I've gotten good enough, I think, in my system where I think every broadcast is only about seven or eight um, hours, maybe something like that to, to prep each game. So but, you know, but there's two games a week. So, again, it adds up to, to 25. So, uh, you know, to me, until there's that intersect of football, basketball, where it's 25 plus 25 and that's a 50 hour week. It's it, it's not as uh, audacious as people make it out to be. I mean, I think we can all find 25 hours in a week, even if you had to stay up late to supplement whatever else you're doing. Uh, you know, 25 divided by seven is what, three and a half. So you got to find an average of three and a half hours a day to work on this stuff. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, if you're just starting out in the business and you're working multiple jobs, that can mean, all right, well, I'm burning some damn midnight oil here. Um, you know, this is going to be a long night because I've already worked a, a 10 hour shift and I've got, you know, whatever else I got going on in my life. And now I got to find three hours or four hours, but you'll, you'll do it. It's doable. And then for you and you're working in baseball, uh, take your Mets example. Uh, what was your day to day preparation like there? Uh, how did you try to organize everything to be ready to go for a broadcast? So much with baseball is off season. You just, you know, cause there's so much going on day to day. You don't want to be caught with, uh, <clears throat> you know, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're playing the, the Tampa Bay Rays. That's coming up in a few days. I've got nothing on them. You know, so you want to make sure that in the off season, uh, you've got a really thick folder on everybody so that you can just go in and grab ingredients from it when you when you need it. Um, but 
my, if I'm remembering it right, you know, for a typical Mets day, uh, I try to keep till noon pretty free. You know, so I can sleep in, go work out, have half a life, whatever. And then uh, noon to one is kind of like going through the clips and, you know, going all through the internet and just scouring what's the news, you know, start looking at the press notes if they're available. Um, that's like an hour, you know, and then uh, take a shower one to one thirty. Um, you know, that's a long commute to, to City Field. Uh, so, you know, we get there, you know, leave at one thirty on the subway, get there at two thirty. But the whole time using that time to start going over notes, adding some more things. We try to get there two thirty or three to just start putting everything together. And you want to leave yourself plenty of time to go down, talk to the manager, go to the pregame press conferences back when that was a thing. Uh, talk to players on the field. And then my goal was always by five o'clock to be in the booth. It's all, you know, just writing down the lineup and, you know, putting your, your notes next to each player. Like, all right, you know, I want to make sure that I mentioned McNeil's got an 11 game hitting streak. So I'm going to write plus 11 right next to his name, all that stuff. And then at six, go have dinner, shoot the shit with the guys in the, you know, in the media room. And I always tried this. It didn't always work, but I'd always try to leave. You know, if we get on the air at seven o'clock for a seven ten game, we didn't have to do a pregame, thankfully. Um, you know, that six thirty or six forty to seven, I would always just kind of try to take like a ten minute walk, just like around the concourse, and just kind of get a feel, get a vibe. The you know the fans, what are they talking about, and uh, you know just w- what's it feel like in the ballpark tonight, and just clear my head. You know, just take a nice cleansing, deep breath kind of walk. And then, you know, maybe 10 minutes to air, it's like, all right, you know, shit's getting real. Let's get in there, um, get your game face on. And I don't always remember to do this, but one little trick I've learned is during the anthem, uh, I'm not suggesting take a knee or anything, but I mean, but just, you know, rather than sing along with the anthem and put your hand on your heart, you know, I would take that time and just kind of take a breath, you know, maybe a moment of gratitude, like, Let's remember, you know, even if this is a five hour game with a rain delay, it's a really cool ass job. You know, I love what I'm doing. Uh, every day is a blessing. Thank you, you know, for letting me be here today and having this opportunity. This is, you know, I'm going to go give my best. You know, it's a little Stuart Smalley. I'm good enough. I'm strong enough kind of thing. But I just I always try to do that. And, and the anthem, because it's like 90 seconds, because I always felt like that's a good time to do that. And, you know, you're not on the air. So that was always just kind of like my all right good attitude got my stuff here's my pencil here's this you know whatever here we go and uh you know then you never know what's going to happen you just got to kind of relax and and let the game come find you yeah we talked so many times with broadcasters who went through this past year covid year not being able to go to the clubhouse not having the same kind of relationship with the managers they once had just how valuable was that time for you what were you kind of looking to glean from some of those guys and then how much did you go back to it during the broadcast maybe more than even some of the stats and some of the different things you could research I felt that during my time doing TV, I was more likely to to weave in that that kind of stuff because I just you know you, you don't you don't have graphics on radio, right? I mean, so I always felt like I don't have to be so stat heavy on TV. I think it's more anecdotal because if somebody's got an 11 game hitting streak, they'll throw it up there as a graphic, you know. And I wanted to be cognizant of it. So as soon as McNeil gets his hit, it's like and there's the 12 game hitting streak. You, know, you can't be um, you know, not cognizant of what's going on, but I found that it was a lot more important on TV, I think, to have those anecdotes and, you know, the whole, well, yeah, on the field before the game, this, that, and the other. There's not always time on the radio to get that in, but I think that stuff's important too. And the the guardrail is, I, I think, you know, and I think analysts do this more than play-by-play guys, but I this is just a, a pet peeve of mine. I don't know if it's just, I take it the wrong way. But I don't think there's a need to say all the time, well, as so-and-so told me before the game, you know, it just sounds so self-important, you know, or like, I'm just, hey, guys, I'm proving to you that I'm doing my work. You know, I went down there and I talked to the manager. Um, I think it's okay just to say, you know, so-and-so said before the game or I heard before the game that, you know, or whatever. Um, I don't think you have to, like, make a big federal case out of, like, and I, you, you hear that a lot on network broadcasts I, I remember on fox sometimes they would coach you like you know let people know that you're an insider you know so tell them that you talk to francisco lindor before the game and i just I, I don't know i think that's kind of heavy-handed if it's overdone but uh, but but it is important to just kind of go and and get uh, a feel from from guys and talk to them and 
I know during the pandemic that's not been possible. It's a huge pain in the ass. But once it becomes possible again, I think that's a really important part of storytelling. And Josh, somewhat of an overarching question, but for and our audience is catered mostly to college broadcasters. And, and I'm sure you get a lot of tape from young broadcasters and you listen to there's a lot of young guys on network TV now and, and on radio. Just when you listen to some of the younger broadcasters and some of the younger generation, what are some things that you're hearing that maybe are pet peeves and, and you think that the younger generation kind of needs to work on a little bit? Well, it's so funny now being in not that generation because, I mean, you know, I've always felt like I was a young guy in the room because I used to be and now I'm, I'm the old part. But um, I don't mean to sound pandering when I say this. There are so many freaking good announcers now. I mean, I used to think that when it's like, oh, all these guys coming out of Syracuse, you know. Well, yeah, that's still true. But, uh, you know, I mean, I got to know Noah Eagle a little bit. I mean, good Lord. I mean, just so technically sound. And he, I mean, when he was 19, he was like perfect. You know, it's like what? You know, how are all these guys doing that? And I, and I, I think there's a lot to be said for you know. There's now the ability to fire up Madden, you know, and or whatever, and just practice all the time. And you know, go to your uh, local high school game and, and practice all the time. Guys are so good now. They're they're so fundamentally sound, and they 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 get to break so easily. Nothing flusters them. I mean, it took me years to, to figure out how to do that. So uh, it, it's one of those things where it's like the athletes, right? You know, you want to say, well, you know, my day, you know, I mean, Babe Ruth was the greatest power hitter that ever. No, I mean, there are so the athletes are so much better now. And it's the same way with broadcasting. The broadcasters are so much better now. They just are. So there's more competition, but there's also a much bigger landscape. I mean, there's not just two network jobs and, you know, 20 play by play jobs. I mean, it, it, there's a ton of work out there now, you know, and now there's streaming and now you can go do something on Twitch and now there's podcasting. And, you know, I mean, so there's a lot of other ways to get heard and get noticed. There's ESPN one, two and three. And every once in a while, the Ocho, you know, I mean, like uh, I, I don't even know who the cornhole guy is, but he, he's great. You know, the, the Johnsonville, you know, cornhole stuff on ESPN. Somebody like became the voice of that and they're they're they kick ass at it. It's you know, there's so many chances to find your own thing now. So um the one thing that as a, a a fart, you know, as an old codger, that just it doesn't hit me the wrong way. It's just kind of the, the one thing I, I I'm a little um I don't know, just kind of wistful about is there is a little bit of uh sameness to it where it's like you can almost always tell the guys out of Syracuse because they're all really damn good and they're always functional and always, you know, I don't want to say it's cookie cutter, but it's like, you know, there are 300 guys that could very easily do a game on ESPN or ESPN two right now. And they're completely interchangeable because they're all really, really good. So how do you stand out? You know, what's different? And, um, you know, I'm not saying you need a shtick because I think that goes way the other way either. You, know, you don't want to be, you know, the, whatever guy, you know, I was just watching the office rerun last night where Ryan, the temp doesn't want to be known as the anything guy. It ends up being known as the fire guy because he left the cheese pita in the microwave too long. It's like, great. Now I'm a guy, you know, so you don't want to necessarily have a shtick, but I think to, to have a personality to have, so if somebody tunes in, they hear your voice, they know immediately, Oh, you know, this guy's it's that guy. And whether I like him or I don't like him, I can identify him as opposed to it's like, OK, which of the 300 guys out of Syracuse is this guy? Because they're all really great. I just don't know which one this is. They've all got a good voice. They've all got great breath control. They are all very descriptive. So it, I mean, it's a blessing and a curse. Right. I mean, you come out of a great program, you're doing great work. And all of a sudden you're just in a pile now of, you know, a bunch of other guys that are also really that good. So. I don't know. I mean, this is just me. But if, if you want people to kind of know your name and, and, you know, maybe it's finding something else, you know, a podcast that you create or you, uh, you, you created a website or you created this or that. I mean, just something where it, it, or you have a, a certain inflection or so anything that sets you a little bit apart, because um, there's just so much good work out there right now. It all gets kind of jumbled together. 
this will be the final one for me, but you've been pretty open uh, about your battle with, with mental health and, and you started a website to, to help other people. And I don't feel like it's talked a lot about uh, with people in this profession because everyone thinks of broadcasters as confident people when that red light comes on. And, and I know I'm far away from being a confident human being, but you got to find ways to define that for you. Why, why was it important for you to, to go public with that and, and try to help other people? Well, I think that last part, I mean, just to let people know that if you got something like that that you struggle with, that you're not alone. I think that's the, the scary part is thinking there's something wrong with you or, you know, that no one can relate to this. And as it turns out, we're all working through something, you know, and, and sometimes it manifests as anxiety. Uh, that has kind of been my thing. Um, you know, I had a brief bout with depression that I figured out, uh, you know, years and years ago. Um, and uh, figured out some strategies to manage that. You know, I mean, some people come by it, honestly, there's a family history of it kind of thing, and I'll put my hand in the air for that. Uh, you know, some people don't know what it is or where it came from. They just know they're, they're not feeling quite right right now. So I don't have any degree in this. I mean, I'm certainly no psychologist or, or no sage, but what I do know is that there's a community for it, right? I mean, that, that uh, if you're feeling a little off, that is kind of like join the club. You know, everybody's dealing with something. Well, I started the show by asking you about your broadcasting bucket list, and now you are uh, with UCLA, of course, doing uh, football and men's basketball. And I think a lot of fans that are watching who loved hearing your baseball work want to know, is there going to be some baseball uh, down the road in your future, and is that something you do want to return to eventually? Yeah, I, I'd never say never. I mean, I do miss baseball. I, I do. You know, the the everyday rhythm of play by play. And I admire so much the Howies and the Eric Nadels and the Denny Matthewses that literally, you know, for dozens of years, they just punched a clock. Then, obviously, you know, I mean, guys have just made it their life and, and saw it all the way through. Um, I don't know that 162 is ever going to appeal to me again. That's just such a large number. And I feel like I've lived that life. Um when I filled in for the Red Sox a couple years ago and did, I think it was like 55 games, that's a great number because I, I love baseball, love talking about it. Uh, you know, if there was ever the chance to do somewhere between five and 55 games again, sure, I would love to do that. Um, but I admire, uh, you know, especially in the minors where you're, you know, not only are you working at this craft every day, but you're, you know, selling advertising and you're writing the press notes and you're doing a podcast and you're running social media. I mean, there, I got so much respect for it. It's just, I've done it, you know, and I'm not ready to retire, but I, I just also want to have some time to, to not uh, be working like a maniac anymore. Cause like I say, I did that in my twenties and uh, it's horrible advice to say, Hey kids, don't work so hard. I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just saying, keep it in balance, keep yourself in check. You know I mean? Give yourself those three or four hours a day. Like I say that you're doing your prep, Turn off your phone. Do it right. You know, it's like the old Cal Ripken thing. It's not practice makes perfect. It's perfect practice makes perfect. Um, so do your job well when you're asked to do it. But please leave yourself some wiggle room to go have a hobby. You know, go have a life. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great industry. I mean, you guys are both kicking ass. And this is a great example of this, you know, this one off that you've uh, done, you know, with the broadcaster hour, it's informative, it's cool. I'm, I'm a fan, uh, you know, and, and it sets you apart, right? You know, I mean, not everybody's doing this. So, uh, thank you guys for what you're doing and, and keep up the great work. Yeah, Josh, thank you so much for the time you've given us. You know, Kyle got to hear you a lot up in New Jersey. My only connection to the Mets was being the voice of the 2008 Kingsport Mets calling home runs for Willard Flores. Yeah. But I uh, loved listening <laughs> to you and Howie with the Mets for so long. We keep, can't wait to keep hearing you more on UCLA. Well, rock on, guys. You guys are both uh, should be super happy with what you're doing, and, and I'm really flattered that you asked me to come on. So have a, have a great day and appreciate you. Thanks, Josh. Right, thanks bet. to Josh Lewin, and thank all of you for watching Broadcaster Hour.